Hello and welcome to the Kuyamungay Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Rivera, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education, and Outreach, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, volunteers, and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Kuyamungay Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we do take an open approach and we're inviting scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. These weekly Sunday discussions are available on demand. We have a couple hundred presentations between webcasts and YouTube videos and all of that and podcasts. So these are all free and they're available. And it's a nonprofit. Of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamungay Institute. And this brings us to today's topic, art. Art has that ability to transcend language barriers, cultural differences, and divides in society. It's serving as a universal medium for expressing and communicating, and on a deeper level, we're finding a bridge to the realms of consciousness to the subconscious. And within the almost 50 year history of this institute, we've continued connecting that relationship to art, human consciousness, and how art can serve as a form of self-discovery, healing, as well as expanding that tapestry of the human experience. In, in essence, it's about exploring that relationship between art and these altered states of consciousness. So we're excited today to tap into the research of our guests, research that's indicating that spending just 45 minutes engaged in an art project can reduce the stress hormone cortisol and how one art experience per month can add 10 years to one's lifespan. Whoa. Well, art is one of those universal languages, and indeed, Paul, bridging from the conscious to the subconscious realms, it's a powerful language. It's communicative, and it speaks volumes, reaching deep into our core to move us, shape us, flow with us, and it has much greater impact on many levels than we generally acknowledge today. I think about ancient art, what we study, and how Everything our ancestors made was art, at least to our eyes today, and how the natural world, the unadulterated, pristine, interactive earth in her prime, that was their backdrop to their art, to the symbols and the songs and the dance, the myth, the stories that they communicated through. Art for them was a repository, the grand canvas for how they made sense of the world. And then I look at us today and in our man-made bubbles, Everywhere we look, our eyes take in a million symbolic messages a day. Our screens deliver a million more stories. We fill our ears with music constantly, lyrics, sung poetry. We're saturated with colors. The range and intensity of the natural world cannot duplicate. We are awash in the arts. Mm. And design, be it utilitarian or aesthetically motivated, it's everywhere. And I wonder if that's why our culture today tends to take the arts for granted or why many of us say, oh, I'm not an artist. I didn't know anything about art. Oh, but you are and you do. It's a language that we all know. And we can ask, yes, but how much of all this is art today? And we can ask, what is it all saying today? But that's another story. My point is art is built right into us. The neurocircuitry is built into our DNA. And I think that's why creating art, as we're going to learn, interacting with art is so healing. 
our bodies, our brains imbibe art and respond accordingly. It's the basis of why our work works too. And if we're going to transform society for the better, the arts combined with the science of how to optimize them is one of the most exciting avenues mm -hmm. to affect positive change that we have today, individually and collectively. And the how and the why and the how-to of this transformation, beautifully covered in the book, Your Brain on Art, How the Arts Transform Us. And the two authors are here with us today, Susan Magsanen, the founder and director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she's a faculty member. So good to see the arts there in that, that stalwart institution. She's also the co-director of the Neural Arts Blueprint with the Aspen Institute. She works with both the public and private sectors using arts and culture, evidence-based approaches in health, child development, workforce innovation, oh. rehabilitation, and social equity. I mean, wow. <laughs> and then we have Ivy Ross, who I had the pleasure of meeting recently. And she started as an innovative and award-winning jewelry designer with pieces in the permanent collections of 12 international museums. She then moved on to the business sector at Calvin Klein, Swatch, Coach, Mattel, all big brands we know and others. And for the last eight years, she's been the vice president of design for the hardware product area at Google, where she and her team have racked up over 200 global design awards. Wow. Um, I want to thank Jeff Volk for introducing me to, to uh, Ivy. He said, oh, you've got to read this book, Your Brain on Art. I'm like, yes, Jeff, I have. And they're on my wish list. And here they are yeah. today. What so, an honor. Thank you both for being yeah, here. Yeah, so good to have you both. No, great to be here. Your, I, your motto, art and science make magic happen. And I love that that is within us. We are the cauldron in which that magic happens. We need to look at how art is expressive, built into us, how we can change the world with it. And uh, indeed, you say we're on a cusp of a revolution to make better use of art in all of its forms. And uh, we want to hear the how. How did you two meet, by the way? You want, you want to start, Susan? Sure. Oh, sure. Such a good, you study how art transforms us, and Ivy, you start to put it into action and practical terms. What a good marriage. So. Yeah, although you know, I have to say, after working together, we realize artists and scientists are very similar in that we both ask questions and we are relentless to find the answer. But go ahead, Susan. Curiosity is another one of our kind of uh, mantras and just being incredibly curious. Uh, so I met Johns Hopkins in the School of Medicine, as you said. And interestingly, you know, it's the reason that I'm in the School of Medicine is we had a donor who came to Hopkins and wanted to give a large sum of money, but she had one condition, which was that they needed to study the arts. Uh, and, you know, School of Medicine sort of scratched their heads and were like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, and so I had been working um, for a number of years using the arts in learning and was working in the School of Education, had just sold a company called Curiosity Kits. And um, they invited me to meet with the donors. And it was very clear from the beginning that they were um, solely focused on the fact that the arts could save us. And, um, oh. and so we took it on and we really started to find our way through what now has become the field of neuroaesthetics and the science of neuroaesthetics. And so over the years, we've you know, developed models for how to study the arts interdisciplinarily, how to think about it in a very generative way. But in 2017, we wanted to lift up luminary scholars, people in the field, in the, in the real world, uh, who were doing extraordinary things through the lens of arts and aesthetic experiences. And I had been um, tracking Ivy's career for 20 years because I was working with youth. She was working at Mattel. I really loved the way she was um, truly trailblazing organization development, bringing people together, thinking about this work and, and really changing the way we create things. So I linked in her, I didn't know her, I linked in her like you would like a blind date. And I said, hi, I think we have something in common and um, here's what I do and would love to meet you. Um, and she wrote me back. So um, that's sort of how our relationship started, sort of going out to the universe and saying, you know, hello, um, what do you think? 
So I would get about 300 LinkedIn invites a day. And usually it's like swipe, no, 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 no. And I see this um, Arts to Mind Lab, two of my favorite things. It's like, yes. And we make a 30 minute call, which then turned into, you know, we, we both had a whole host of meetings the rest of the day. And I said, I'll cancel my next one. Will you cancel yours? And she said, okay, I'll cancel the one after that. And so it ended up being a three hour introductory call because we found out that we, you know, when Susan said to me, you know, my lab has proven that the arts change our physiology and our brain and body. And I kind of said, well, I know that. That's why I do what I do. And it was like, but wait a minute, <laughs> the world doesn't and the masses don't. And this is such incredibly important information. And then she came uh, up to Mill Valley and we created a salon in my living room between, it was like Noah's Ark. We curated two dancers, two singers, two painters, two of every kind of art form. Mm -hmm. And she flew in with her neuroscientists and it was uh, an afternoon of conversation between the two groups. And at the end of it, we're cleaning up and Susan said, I've always wanted to write a book about this. Do you want to do it with me? And I said, yes, this is the book I've been waiting for because throughout my creative career, I had been asked to do books on innovation, creativity. And I, you know, I'm a lifelong learner and I thought, well, that's what I do every day. And I, there's no learning for me in that book. But this one was absolutely yes. Yeah. And then and it took it to speak to groups like you are in the middle of a trip right now about, hey, art's important and here's why. Now we have the data to back it up. Here's why. That's oh, yeah, we're, we're so excited for our society today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of the amazing things that have come from it is both the individual love letters about you've given me permission to make art again, mm -hmm. which you know, because so many people are shut down in schools or by their parents, it's not, you know, you're not going to make a living at this. And then people have held up the book and said, we've raised money for our organization based on this book. So, um, and in or fact, I'm here, I'm here, what? Right. Or we've changed our practice. We've added another element to what we're doing as a practitioner, or we're getting policies in our organizations because leadership is now listening to us. And I mean, it's, it's a cascade of things that has really in no way did we have any idea that we would open this door. I think that's another really important thing is that we believed in it, but we had no idea that this would sort of ignite the kind of, yes, we need this, um, that, is ha that it has. Art is medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as we say in the book, I think the timing couldn't be, well, the, we didn't know this. The timing couldn't be better because people are clearly hungry for this. And, and we think it's because we've been, optimizing for productivity and efficiency since the industrial revolution. And we push the arts aside, which, and the arts, as you said, I mean, it's about self-expression and no wonder, you know, <laughs> we're getting ill as a society because we keep suppressing this self-expression wow. in service of efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And um, so the reaction we've gotten, which I said was unexpected. I mean, the publisher said, oh, just to prepare you, any books with the word art never hit the New York Times bestseller list. And that's not why we were writing the book anyway. So we said, okay. But you proved and them then, wrong. Yeah. yeah, and then sure enough, he, he uh, reaches out, I think within the first week and said, guess what, ladies? So it just, you know, it shows that people are craving without even realizing what they were looking for, you know, mm -hmm. and this has um, opened up an incredible dialogue and movement that we're just helping to fuel. Beautiful, wow. Yeah. Uh, what kind of positive changes happen from just creating art versus just looking at art? Because, and how would that help us transform society? How would that make us a happier society? What needs to happen? And in, in what's the grand vision? Using art. If you could wave a wand, awesome. what would you like to see happen mm -hmm. um, in the world mm -hmm. to yeah. make the full use of this? Well, maybe I'll start. I, we, we, yep. we, we do talk a lot about this um, and, you know, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's emerging, right? This is an emerging field where it's becoming something. And so you mentioned the neuro arts blueprint, which is really a global uh, initiative to create 
uh, the tent poles to build a field like bioethics, like women's health, like climate, you know, and it's a highly interdisciplinary field. So that is happening um, Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm at the White House on Tuesday. Wednesday, we're bringing together all the leaders of the field around the country and some around the world to really talk about how do we align and how do we move this forward continually in education, in research, in policy, in advocacy, in funding, because there's very little funding in this work um, in the scheme of things. You know, we NEA, which is fabulous, has less than $200 million in its budget, annual budget. We spend $3 billion a year on Alzheimer's research. So, you know, we have uh, an army of the willing in terms of artists, but they're under-resourced, underpaid, under-leveraged. Um, so that's really important. But on the other end of it, where I think, I mean, I both believe this is that this has to happen on an individual level. You have to know it and want it and understand the power of it because then that's like a million or 7 billion flowers blooming. And so we're very focused on um, taking the book now and activating it, bringing the book to life at an individual level, at a community level, at a societal level, because we think that once you feel it, once you feel the ritual, I loved how you talked about this earlier. Once you feel the power of expression, whether it's dancing, singing, um, expressive writing, um, nature, you never go back, right? Direct because you experience. realize your yeah. thirst for it is feeding you. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, on a, an individual, individual can level, take this yeah. on. The individual Sorry. can take this on. I can employ this on an individual level. I don't have to wait for any government no, agency today. to do so. Today. I can do it today. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's the message when we say, you know, 15 minutes of an art activity and it doesn't matter what it is, and you don't have to be good at it. Um, you know, and yeah, people are creating things based on this date night, you know, art date night with another couple. It's like, let's get a lump of clay and just start moving it around. You know, we've never done watercolors, let's do it. So, I mean, the whole point is to remove the judgment out of it. And as you said, you know, in indigenous tribes, they didn't have a word for art because it was the way they lived. It was culture. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to get back to that place. I mean, singing, dancing, storytelling, it was pure. And, it, and also these things are pure joy. Susan and I were just, um, in fact, I'm here in this unesthetic hotel room, i.e. my background in Palm Springs, because we, um, we just gave a talk yesterday to the music center in LA about, you know, dance is joy. I mean, bring it to the streets, you know, take yes. it out of the theaters mm -hmm. and bring it to the streets. So we think, you know, empowering people to um, like the notes we've been getting, the people have been shut down about expressing themselves and about the art because of these judgments have come in. And so just starting to do that, getting out of our cognitive mind into our body and being able to express ourselves, that message of everyone should just start doing that um, is, you know, what we're doing, what we're trying to uh, spread on the individual level. And then as Susan says, you know, someday we want to get art um, reimbursed by health companies, you know, art therapists. Um, oh, yeah. It's being oh, used, yeah. you know, it's being used yeah. for all kinds of, um, in certain countries, there's social prescribing, there's doctors prescribing people mm -hmm. to go to museums. Um, and it would be great if eventually, you know, that got covered. Susan and I also gave a talk to the school superintendents of California about, um, they voted to put art back in the schools, but to please make it a mindset, you know, not just hire your art teacher and check the box, but mm -hmm. it's actually a mindset to get in that flow state that you're in when you're yeah, the flow state. deeply immersed in the project. And also, also that Mihai Mikshent Mihai on the flow state. Yeah. Who, yeah. I love his earliest book, yeah. to put that through. I just want to say that I grew up in a family that appreciated art. Mother taking us to all the museums, like everywhere on a daily basis, even in our hometown. I mean, not daily basis, but uh, on a regular basis. Regular basis. And my sister and her husband, in uh, when she was living in Sun Valley, we'd go there for several weeks around the holidays. Idaho. They had a barn devoted to every art supply you could imagine. And we all just gathered in the barn and did art all day. Yeah. And then on New Year's Eve, uh, our celebration was, hey, let's just put a little gallery of our art. And we all went around, you know, invited friends and family, just look at art, 
So it was an opportunity so, to do a non-alcoholic yeah. celebration for New Year's where we all would stay up till midnight doing art. And then we'd mm -hmm. be oh, at, 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 and then at the art. top of the hour, then we would, everybody would go around and see everybody else's pieces and what we've And then light the bonfire and go out and dance yeah. in the snow. Yeah. But, That's a great idea. Yeah. 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 I want to say that a number of artists that I know who want to um, help afford their own, gal their own uh, workspace are now taking subscriptions where people can come in and play with them. So if you mm -hmm. can't afford your own art space and all the art supplies or the kiln or the this or the that, they're getting together in collectives and doing just that. Mm -hmm. Let's have access and help cooperatively pay for the for the art space. So you know, I love that. I, we had heard about that. That that is such a great community idea. I love that. And building community, it. which is yeah. what it's all about. I do appreciate that you are both about building positive relationships, building community through the arts. It's not just art for art's sake. It's not just art for aesthetics. We have a little art and spirit activity and we say it's not about what you produce. It's about the mm -hmm. internal process mm -hmm. of art. It's about the internal process of listening and letting your guy, hand be guided by some force larger than yourself, about connecting to the universe in a way that it's flowing through you right. and it wants to express itself. And what does that mean? So it's just so many multifaceted. Um, so yeah, no, we have this, we often say art creates culture and culture creates community. I mean, uh, it is. Yeah. And you know, museums and libraries, schools, as Ivy said, are all starting to reevaluate, performing arts centers are all starting to reevaluate their role in the community, not as object holders, as collectors, but as these dynamic places for insight and meaning and identity and purpose and making themselves more welcome to everybody. So it's you know affordable, it's accessible and it's immediate. And I think we haven't thought about the arts like that before. We've thought about them as a luxury, a nice to have. And now we're starting to see this, that we're wired, it's our birthright um, and that it needs to be woven through all the areas of our lives and in, in very um, intentional ways um, as opposed to kind of a, if I have time, right? Yeah. Well, and also get rid of this. Oh, I'm not an artist because I didn't study art. I didn't go to school to art. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a professional artist. Yes, you're an artist. We're all well, actually, artists. we have a close. You're dressed in the morning. You're an artist, right. right? This is your canvas, right? I just think that that. Go ahead. I was going to say we have a close friend who's a classically trained artist who spent her entire lifetime studying art. She says it's really curious to me that people get to retirement age and everybody's deciding they're going to be an artist. And so it's a little bit of a judgment to the comment, but at the same time, flipping it upside down and saying there's something like about being free to go back to that self-discovery that art provides. There's some power in that. I was also going to take a quote from the uh, chat room just so that mm -hmm. you got a chance to see it. And that was, Tenley says, great news, your book's being used by the Newark's public schools in New Jersey, and it's given to all supervisors and administrators. So, Yay. yeah. Wow, so, I, I just got that. the chills. Yeah, we didn't know that. Oh, wow. that's so Fantastic. cool. So yeah. given all that you've done and the far reaches of this collaboration and collective collection of, of hey, power of art, how is the original donor? What does she say now about where her, her funds have gone and the you know, issue put so, them to? It's so interesting. First of all, this that you just put up here about the New York Public Schools, thank you. You know, the book is not even a year old yet. I want to say that too. Wow. So you know, when you think about how much momentum this birth has had, it's really sort of extraordinary. So we had a we had a meeting. Um, the donor's now in her late eighties, and um, she we had an event in November called Intentional Spaces, and at the Blue, new Bloomberg building in Washington D.C. And it, it, I always say this was an event for one. It was for one family that you really had. I wanted to honor her. And she is so proud and so happy that we've been able to like crack this open. And you know, I said to my husband recently that I feel like, you know, we have honored her wish. And there's still so much more to do, but like the genie's out of the bottle, right? Yeah, and that's right. what she wanted. And so I'm really proud of that. Um, you know, of all the things for her, she, we could not be here with out one person, one human being that said this matters. And, you know, a school of medicine, everybody was like, whatever. Um, you know, they were, they, they, they didn't placate her. They seriously went at it, but they had no idea. And now the president's super behind it. The deans are behind it. I work with every school at Hopkins and then schools all over the world. We, we work with so many different 
folks. And it's because of this one person. Um, I mean, I, I, I feel she, we owe her a great debt. Wow. Talk about a change maker. A yeah. change maker, right. Mm -hmm. And, and Tony, I also have, I have to respect, I have some connections at Phillips Exeter Academy that I'd love to uh, hook you up with because, I mean, that's a premium school right there. And Thanks, uh, to get them excited into it would be, would have that? ripples all over the world immediately. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Jeff, this is Susan. My Jeff, this is Susan. This is Jeff, my friend who introduced me. Um, <laughs> And, my friend uh, who introduced me. Who was our guest just <laughs> last week. Yeah. Okay, Jeff. My, actually, my friend who did something better in the world. He's the one who created that initial cymatics book that we oh, often wow. refer to. Wow. Yeah. The publisher. Yeah. New edition just released. Yeah, yeah. 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 We had yes, a long uh, two hours. Uh, discussion we were on this very week. program just a week ago, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there's something about supervisors, leadership, learning about this too. I mean, the artists have always known, but yeah. getting people that are those decision makers to to feel the value and power of this is mm. a real shift. Like Ivy mentioned, we, we met at the Getty with 400 school superintendents. You know, you need to have leaders believe in this. And, you know, that's one of the other things that we're working on. Ivy and I are working on, but working on that across the platform. It's, it you know, you really have to start bottom up, sides in, top down. And I think that's the other Very sort of cool. alchemy of this. Thank right, you, Because we were saying we wanted to write a manual, not just for the teachers, but for the parents mm -hmm. of the kids so that they understood how to foster and hold the container for yeah. this idea of self-expression. I was yeah. also going to share that Tony Hull, who's an astrophysicist, said the leading astrophysics society, the AAS, is including, quote unquote, paint your art workshops at their meetings. Something wow. recognized. Oh, Tony, so. do you want to speak to that for just a moment? Oh, yeah, we'd love to hear about because we love hearing because we incorporated it as examples when we talk. So yeah, we lift well, it up all the time. <laughs> well, well, yes, the, the, the recent president of the AAS actually ran a painting workshop at the summer meeting. Um, and uh, this has been going on for, for two or three years now. It's a recognition, making a connection between, between these worlds where, where you can paint your research or something that your research inspires. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it's really a fun thing. And this is a very serious society. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not, um, um, well, I don't want to say what it's not, but, it, but it's... Um, you know, th this is where Nobel Prize winners presented, things like that. So it, it's pretty, uh, it, it's uh, really interesting that this this comes in. I also have to tell you something interesting about Tony. He travels a lot to Europe and he'll sit at a cafe, pull out his little tiny miniature, beautiful French produced arts, uh, watercolors <laughs> and a little paper. And then people will come over and ask what he's doing and he hands them a brush, come and join me. So he's creating art moments wherever he goes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love that. You're like an art ambassador. I love yeah. that. <laughs> well, you, you know, it really it really takes off. Um, one example, I'm in the farmer's market in Mainz, Germany. There's there are long tables and I wanted to sit down and 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 have a glass of wine and and stuff. And I asked the man there at, at one end of the table, may I sit here? And he went, okay. And I took out my paintings and he started uh and, and started painting and he, he taps on my, my arm and he said, what are you doing? And I passed him the brush and the, the paper and I said, we are doing a painting. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty <laughs> sure all 12 people on that table sense. were participating and the next table came over and wanted to participate. <laughs> this happens all the time, this kind of thing. Oh yeah, it's a great way to connect people. We did this experiment in an app where, um, you know, six people didn't know each other and they were given prompts every morning. You know, so one might be, um, listen to your favorite song and draw what you're hearing. Oh, and then we had, and then we had them post. Mm -hmm. You know, we asked like, what, um, how are you feeling before you did this exercise? And you know, someone would say stressed or tired or, and then afterwards, one word, how are you feeling? And it was, you know, peaceful, happy. You know, and so. It was an interesting way, though, that the, the people bonded over sharing these um, expressions of themselves. So I do think it's a great way to bring people together. Wow. And to make them feel less lonely and more belonging, too, which we're all suffering from in our own ways, right? And so to bring that in is so good. 
kind. You would be interested in little art that we produce after one of our um, sessions. Yeah, ritual body posture trance induced sessions. People are drawing art in the space of 10 minutes. And then we're showing it on screen with one another all over the world. And it's a beautiful way to see inside somebody else's mm. visionary journey. And it's exquisite. A picture is worth a thousand words. It's yeah. A day, yeah. It's a, just a yeah. direct way of sharing in addition to the verbal mm. expression. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think right now in our society, we are so tired of blah, blah, the words. I think images are going to be so much more important. I mean, mm -hmm. it also speaks to a different place in your brain, but we almost need it as a relief. You know, Susan, what Tony was talking about when he said we're doing this reminds me of um, James Taylor's daughter, what she's doing. You may want to talk because that's a really interesting oh, idea. What's the story yeah. there? Before I do, though, Tony, I think you want to share something. Well, oh. well if, if I could really quickly. Yeah. I'm at a conference in Edinburgh. I go into a Curtis restaurant and I start doing doing a painting. I have a rule that I... My, I only made two deliberate marks, and after that, the brush leads the hand, and I don't know oh, what wow. happened. And it, and the owner of the restaurant came over and said, "You've just painted the curd flag," <laughs> and, and invited me to stay after the restaurant closed for the man dance, where the mm -hmm. the, the, the simple music went on. Wow. So, wow. so uh, also I have a rule: I never try to do a good painting. <laughs> That's a good I, rule. Whatever, whatever people do. Wow. Like, Wonderful, you know, but that I love that. You are, I have to share yeah. that with you. Uh, Mary, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Tony may have to be our poster child, Susan. It's I'm like gonna marry Tony. <laughs> Mary and Tony. Yeah, okay. Tony. Art in action. <laughs> Susan's I'm married. I'm projecting her. I'm yeah. married, but I can have multiple husbands. It's okay. One more thought in here before we get serious again. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get to the slideshow um, next. Go ahead. Okay, great. <laughs> Just, I think yesterday morning, they all blur, but I got an email from the um, the museum at the um, University of New Hampshire. It has a beautiful John's Creative Arts Center, wonderful endowed music program, unbelievably endowed. The museum is closing. Uh, and it was written by the curator or someone high up in there. It was a, like too long to read email. So mm -hmm. clearly this person is spearheading an energy that's saying we are being abandoned. So mm. what I would like to see is something like this introduction here, Paul, mm. sent yeah. directly to their inbox with someone to lubricate, so they definitely look at it. Which a copy of their book. Yeah. yeah, copy of their book and just say here, you are not alone. Mm. And then let them take the ball and run with it and get endowed and whatever, however we can connect. I just see that right now we're in a moment, well, we're always in a moment of flux, but this is severe flux. Mm -hmm. And it's happening in every different field you can imagine. But if you have something concrete to offer as you're finding out with the book and the research and all this, it convinces people. It just gives them the encouragement they need to go out and do what they know they need to do. Because right. it can work and people are making it work. Beautiful. Yeah, well, if you send me the person's contact and address, we'll send them a book for sure. And then if you guys want right. to drop right. a note. I, what I'll do is I will um, let you know that I'm going to forward you their email and then I'll forward you the email. Yeah. Okay. I don't yeah. even know who they are. They're just someone who, you know, I go to see jazz concerts there because that program's endowed. It's not going anywhere. Okay. But the arts building is a beautiful building and there's no reason that a class act university like UNH should be closing their museum. It gets back to our priorities. And as Buckminster Fuller said, why aren't we building living re instead of just weaponry? Why aren't we making our world sing and come alive and be joyous and celebrate it? That's our job. That's as the, That's you our know, job. it's interesting. Um, I think that, Jeff, what you say is, it's not a cautionary tale. It's really reflux, right? It's, it's happening again and again. And, you know, art schools are closing. You know, they're, they're, arts are still being taken out of schools and so we have a really big job to do it's it's not like things are even steady state there's some of these are going down the toilet they're quickly. going down right they're going down and and you know there's a lot of i think there's a lot of force to go up against that to move it in the other direction with is what you're saying right. but it is true that it, it is not steady state it's not like you, you know, we're there, we're, we're just getting started in some ways. Yeah, which is why, you know, I think it's like tension of opposites. We have to go into action because I think um, uh, it's almost 
Yeah, it's almost happening so that we can rally even harder and push against it. Um, I, I see the same thing. I think during COVID, a lot of museums, et cetera, you know, a lot struggled. And so they're not, they haven't been able to recover um, as quickly as they need to. Yeah. Well, I'm getting a little Thank bit. Of, you guys. I have a little bit of sound interference coming from your your side. I think Ivy, but we'll see if it clears up. It, yeah, it, it's gone away now. You know, children okay. just hey, I want her, let me, children crayons on paper, and look, they just do art. I mean, it just yeah. demonstrates how me too. we just want to express <laughs> in art. They sing, they dance. You know, yeah, give me yeah. a package of crayons and paper. That yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it's so important. One of, one of the agencies that came forward that they gave us some visionary award. Um, was Thanks, a, a nonprofit who pairs up artists with children who have cancer because they can't communicate to their parents and they assign an artist to the child and the family that works with them through either the recovery hmm. or the loss. Because the using, um, you know, when you're in trauma, what is it, the BRCA region shuts down, you can't even use words. So using art and crayons was a way to express how the family and the child were feeling. So it goes, you know, all the way from uses like that to pure joy and self-expression. I also remember a film that a friend whose parents were afflicted with Alzheimer's showed us. And it was about the therapy of getting a patient who was shut down this because their brain was, oh, that's right. that's and then playing the music of their youth, just giving them headphones and a playlist. Mm -hmm. This is what they danced to when they were 16 or, and yeah. then they started becoming very vocal. Memories came back of that time. It opened up those pathways yeah. and made them accessible in the here and now. Yeah, so it's amazing. Susan could tell you a little bit about that. But ever since I learned that from doing the book with Susan, both my husband and I now have playlists of our favorite songs. She said, make sure, you know, you and Arthur make a playlist and you each have the other. So God forbid you ever get in this condition. Um, um, they That can be played. It's like... Um, the playlist, you know, the song of your life, but the songs of your life. But Susan, you may want to speak to that because it is amazing. What, what yeah, what you've got an expressive arts therapist on your uh, probably more than one on your on your feed here, so they'll oh. they'll really resonate with this. But um, you know, what's amazing about our brains is we have multiple duplicate systems. And so when you're bringing in the, those songs, it's often when you're younger. You know, say in some cases, 10 to 35, 40, you're where laying down tracks. Yeah. you're laying down tracks and also the hormones that are really coming online for you help to kind of create that neuroplastic soup that really embeds this work into the brain. And, you know, initially you record memory in the hippocampus and then, um, and so you kind of consolidate the memory there, but then it gets distributed into other parts of the brain. It could be the amygdala, it could be the BRCA region, it could be the sense, uh, uh, motor redundancy. sensory, it's, yeah. it's redundancy. And that's extraordinary, right? Right. And so when Alzheimer's or cognitive decline starts to hit, and often it starts to uh, erode the hippocampus, um, you, you can't access what might be there in terms of new memories. Like you can't remember what you had for lunch, but you remember what you had did 10 years ago because right. that's been distributed. Um, and that's extraordinary. And so this ability to be able to open up these pathways that were laid down, but maybe dormant because of the trigger of these ritual, highly sensorial, highly salient experiences that are a song. And even, you know, like Ivy, we we're talking about, you know, like her husband, like what are the songs of his life? He's got a story to go with that song, right? And he's gonna tell it, you know, I remember when. And, and, and so the ability to be able to pull those stories associated with those songs, symbols, metaphors, experiences also connects us in a way and that might dissipate, but then you can re-trigger. And so, you know, I can't think of anything that uses these since these that are multi-systems simultaneously. Right. And the joy that came with that time as yeah. well. They're feeling yeah. that, emotion, that emotion. Yeah. Joy. Or, or angst, right? Or or not, right? Like it can be like that song is a breakup song, right? And oh, it, yeah. it was, you know, so I think the range of emotions is what we want to feel. And of course, we, we love feeling pleasure and joy. But sometimes we watched a woman dance Swan Lake. She was a ballerina. Um, we watched her from a wheelchair dance Swan Lake. And there are parts of Swan Lake that are just tragic. And she she felt 
Swan Lake and she redid it. She redanced it in a wheelchair. But wow. she was told the cool thing is she was totally slumped over, inactive, incoherent, couldn't move, couldn't talk. And her son or something puts on Swan Lake because he knew she was a prima ballerina. She was Italian, I think, doing Swan Lake. And it is all of a sudden you see her graceful 92 year old arms moving in the exact um, articulation of her in that moment of being a prima ballerina, it brought her right back right. to it. And she's reenacting the whole thing. I mean, we were just bawling our eyes out. <laughs> oh, I have to say that we think we're so human centric, but really this is across the board, maybe with just mammals, right? Because I remember talking to an animal trainer who rescued the old circus animals, the, the horses that had done their day and the, on the tracks and the races and they were rehabilitating. And he described playing the song that a circus elephant that was highly trained to dance. He played that song to this retired old elephant and he began to dance that dance. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not just us. Mm. It's just like, right, right. Right. yeah, yeah. how we're designed across life. Wow. So we well, talk about here. the design of life. I was listening to public radio this morning and they were talking mm -hmm. about the giant redwoods that had gotten torched in all the lightning strike mm -hmm. fires recently. Yeah. What they found was they could drill a core to the center of the trunk, find these bud cells that were storing carbon from however long ago. Wow. And as soon as they're uncovered, they start to sprout again. Uh, so yeah, yeah. like- Life you are, are neurologically mimicking these yeah. systems that are fundamental in nature. Give me a chance and I'll grow more. Yeah. Nature Good. and her redundancy. Thank you, Jeff. Nature and Thank her storing you. the seeds and the codes. I'm yeah. being respectful of time because I know that Ivy has to check out of a hotel. I want to <laughs> go through your beautiful slide program today. Sam, you have your hand up. Can we uh, get to your question real quickly? And then we're going to go to the slideshow. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I am a composer. I have written an oratorio, the story of which is the is it's called the Emergent Universe Oratorio. There is a huge concert being planned for 2025. Everything that you absolutely phenomenal women have been talking about is exactly word for word what we are doing, what we are moving toward. And I would give anything to be able to connect with you and not be one of the, one of the, uh, you know, the right, little right. emails <laughs> that gets bypassed. So, um, uh, and I and I want to keep this super brief for for the you know for everyone. So uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to do that. Can you I... email us and we'll forward it? Yeah, we to have gone. Yeah. Yeah, and love we'd love like it. to hear more about this as well. Yeah, Sam, we'll forward so forward come it back and okay? talk to us on a, on a Sunday. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. So yeah, well, we'd love to be. We'd love to hear about it. I mean, that's what we say. We're trying to create a movement. Part of it is gathering what's going on and trying to amplify it in some way. Fantastic. We're going to watch for your emails. Sam. Okay, Sam. Thank you. Email Very us. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Doing you. this, Thank bringing you. this to life. All right. Queer Monday Institute at gmail.com. Queer Monday Institute at gmail.com. And I'm Thank sure you can right. find these gals on LinkedIn as well. But... Susan's going to launch with us. You know, I just want to say they say uh, <laughs> picture tells a thousand stories because imagery is so powerful right. so i appreciate you putting the words and imagery together to highlight some of your key points so let's yeah and so this is going to feel a bit formal compared to this wonderful yes, uh, answer which i love so so just you know know that this is a much more but it's like a 20 minute formal presentation that kind of sure. lays down some of the fundamentals but i love this warm-up conversation i think it's going to get even better afterwards so oh, good yeah. thank you yeah, maybe it's almost like this is a, let's think of it as a piece of art that we're going to give to you of, kind of the way we experience, the way we share this and, and that we hope is helpful. But I think it, we're not singing to the chorus, we're singing with the chorus today. So um, I don't know, I think, you know, I think this is, a, will just fuel more conversation. Um, and we've covered a lot of ground that I think we, I mean, are going to talk about too. So let me pull the deck up and we'll jump in and um, just be a little mindful of time. Oh, whoops, sorry, let me go back. Um, technology is not my thing. Um, hold on. I'm the, I'm the depth driver today. All right, let me, okay, tell me if you can see this. I, I won't be able to see you. We can see but it. We see it. We see the okay, preparation. Great. 
Yeah, right. there you go. So we usually start by saying, hi, I'm Ivy, but you know that already. <laughs> and I'm Susan, and you know that already. <laughs> All right, let me, there we go. Okay. We're ready for the quiz now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we are, uh, we are standing on the verge of a cultural shift in which the arts can deliver potent, accessible, proven health and well-being solutions to billions of people. We've been optimizing for productivity since the Industrial Revolution, pushing the arts aside or making them a luxury, thinking that the focus on productivity would make us happy, but we are not. In fact, we're seeing the impact of that in the surge of mental health issues that are now surpassing physical health issues. We believe it's essential to come back to our senses, the things that we know alive in us. What we're seeking more than ever on an individual and societal level is transformation. The arts in all forms are a gateway to this transformation. Digital arts, visual arts, poetry, design, sculpture, architecture, and so much more. Um, so we believe this is an exciting time where the science and the arts are coming together to show us that in fact, we are wired for art. So we've talked a little bit about this idea of indigenous cultures. And, you know, when we started to work on this project, it took us four years to write the book. Um, it really, we kept going back to thinking more deeply about the role that the arts once played in our lives. And we were really honored to be able to talk with a number of indigenous cultures as we were working on the book. And we learned that there are still over 5,000 indigenous cultures that are thriving and active in the world. And I think that's pretty extraordinary. Um, and, and as you said earlier, um, you know, indigenous cultures, most indigenous cultures don't have a word for art because it's how they live their daily lives. Um, they sing, dance, tell stories, but it's ingrained and, in, and woven through all the rituals and things that happen throughout the day. In fact, if in the book, you'll see that we talked with um, a Hopi um, tribes person who um, explained to us the value of corn across all of the different areas of their community. So this is, a, a, I think, a really beautiful piece of a Colombian cave art painting that really just represents in this time daily life. And this is another piece um, that we found by a, uh, a um, geologist named David Zhang, and it's a 226,000 year old piece of art that was found in Tibet. And what we love about it, if you look really closely, it, you can see hands and feet. And these are still the same tools that we use today to create our world. And so the, I think the takeaway here is that we're both makers and beholders, and we have been since the beginning of time. And it's how we've done everything that we do in terms of how we communicate, how we share information, how we understand ourselves, but also how we heal and how we thrive. And so, you know, we really strongly believe that the arts and these aesthetic experiences are our birthright. Um, when we were working on the book, we had the real privilege of meeting E.O. Wilson, who um, probably many of you know was uh, an evolutionary biologist at Harvard. And he studied ants and then studied bees. And he ultimately went down the, the species chain to understand humans. And what he really believed was that um, without these arts and aesthetic experiences, humanity could, could not evolve. And we evolved in the way we did because of these unique experiences. But that said, the only way that we can really um, uh, really create and behold art is through our sensory systems. And you know, Ivy and I both have become um, pretty geeky around this under unbelievable mechanisms that we have in terms of our senses. So in the in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the sort of data points, but a couple of things that I think just to ground you in this miracle of your senses is that, you know, in each of your fingers, you have over 3000 touch receptors in your body. You have over 4 million touch receptors that activate the thalamus and then the somatosensory cortex. So you're instantly creating this cascade of neurotransmitters, including oxytocin, which, you know, so you know this, when you hold someone's hand, you instantly have that connection. Um, and thinking about something like the nose, um, we know that we have, we can smell over 1 trillion odors and we have over 400 different types of scent receptors that turn over every 30 to 60 days. So your body is an organism like the tree, Jeff was talking about, that's constantly changing and renewing 
renewing itself. Um, we also know that over your lifetime, you'll see over 25 million visual experiences, visual um, impressions, which actually I think is even s small compared to what I think, you know, when you think about how many things we take in every day. Um, and so, you know, we know that our physiology, our sensory inputs are really making such a, a huge difference in how we experience the world. It's the only way that we can. Our hearing is registered quickly in about three milliseconds. And the way sound works in the body, I find fascinating. The sounds we hear are caused by the motion of our eardrums, which cause fluid in your inner ear to move. The fluid inside the inner ear bends hairs on the cells, which convert to nerve impulses that travel to your brain. And these impulses move through the brain via neural networks and evoke strong emotions and memories, altering moods and behaviors instantly. You know, different tempos, languages, and sound levels affect your emotions, mental activities, and physical reactions. Um, researchers have learned how brain waves correlate to musical beats per minute. Our brains gain to the beat of the music, putting us into, as you all know, a variety of states, including alpha waves and delta for sleep. Um, you know, I've been studying sound and vibration for about 30 years. And one of my sound teachers uh, recorded what it sounds like when we're in the womb of our mother, you know, we're a small mass to a lot of water and water and bones amplify sound. So we are swimming in a sonic symphony, literally for nine months, because it's amplified like a thousand times because of the scale of our mass to the fluid. So our mother's heartbeat is the drums, um, the circulatory system are the wind instruments. It's extraordinary. I wish I could find, this was about 30 years ago when I first started studying, he'd um, find this recording because, you know, it's actually... Uh, my experiencing that, and then quite frankly, which we'll get to in a minute, seeing cymatics, um, which all of a sudden I got a download of, I understood what life was about big time. <laughs> um, but you know, you wonder why we come out and we are, mu music moves us, because when you think of it, our supposedly happiest time, tucked away, protected in those nine months, we're floating in a sonic symphony. And you're entrained. Right? You're literally entrained. Yeah, totally. So, you know, sound becomes an excellent tool to regulate stress um, because it works on an unconscious level. The frequency of sound taps into what lies underneath conscious recognition, literally changing the vibrations in your body. And sound vibration has the capacity to return the body to homeostasis and out of that fight or flight reaction. And so I've been known to actually carrying tuning forks, as shown mm -hmm. here in my handbag to work. And I've worked, you know, the last 40 years in corporations and pull out tuning forks in the middle of a meeting when I'm watching a coworker kind of go into a fight or flight mode and I'll hit the tuning fork on a hockey puck um, and hold them one to each ear, rotating them. And all of a sudden you just watch absolutely their whole, everything come down, their blood pressure, their emotions. And, you know, emotions are energy in motion. Um, and each energy has its own frequency. So there's actually, you know, scientific uh, theory being studied about how sound frequency increases our body's natural production of nitric oxide, which would explain how sound alleviates stress because nitric oxide enhances cell vitality and vascular flow and may account for the relaxation effect in the body. So several small studies are now showing that sound frequencies like those that come from tuning forks and even humming can cause nitric oxide to be released in our cells. Oh, wow. Hmm. So these are pictures of um, Susan and my actual voice made visible. You'd have to know us better to um, know which one is which. Um, <laughs> but as you know, I'm sure you all know from um, having Jeff be a friend of the society, um, that this is a, you know, a science called cymatics, which is making sound visible that was started back in the 50s. And so our actual voices were put through the scientific instrument called the cymoscope that John Reed um, developed in the early 2000s. And it literally imprints sonic vibration from our voice on the surface of ultra pure water while a camera films the patterns in the water. And so, you know, when you think about it, 
by making sound visible, along with the knowledge of our bodies are made up of 60% water, we can now understand the impact that sound has on us. Um, here's a short video just showing a woman's uh, voice where her voice is making the patterns real time just to see how powerful this is. Oh, can you turn the sound up? It might um, be suppressed by the Zoom, probably. Hey. Can you hear it? Yes. Yeah, we can't hear it fully, but you get the idea. I mean, every every vowel is changing the wave patterns. And in, you think of that, that's why they say every word, words we say to each other are so important because it's it's a vibration. And aren't we beautifully designed to take those sound waves and create them back as an experience in our brain and our senses and then attach meaning to it? I mean, it's just amazing. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. No, we're incredible. Um, Machines. Designs. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's we're about to find out um, the technology of, of the sacred of ourselves, because I think, um, and this is a little off the talk, but it's important because you bring it up that I think in some way with AI coming in, you know, the machines are going to take some of the rational things off our plate. And so it's going to give us time. We must go inward and understand um, the technologies of ourself and our, and our yeah. sacredness that we've, we've lost um, because we need to exercise. I think that imagination to be able to come back and co-create with the machines mm. anyway. Full circle. Yep. Love that. Yeah. Full circle. So we have, and that's what I mean about the universe is super strategic and is setting this up as a, I think, again, pushing against so that we are forced to go inside. Um, We're actually being impressed upon a mirror image of our own consciousness. And because our consciousness has been ruled by the mind, it's suppressed all those more subtle and malleable elements of itself that mm -hmm. all have to do with relationship to not only what's being expressed outwardly, but what is manifesting inwardly through the imagination. Huh. Mm, I love beautiful. that. Absolutely true. Ooh, just got the chills. Yeah, me um, too. Yeah. So another another great visual that I love, I don't know if some of you have seen this, this is a red quilt. It's made up of, of a series of photos taken of human heart cells under a microscope in a lab at Stanford. And mm. a cardiologist there wanted to generate heart um, tissue in the lab in order to create models that would help explain certain cardiac diseases. And, you know, heart cells are incredibly complex and challenging to create because they're densely packed um, because they have to work together in tandem and beat. And if they're designed too far apart, they won't sink too close together. They could smother and die. So uh -huh. he worked with an acoustic bioengineer at Stanford to move the heart cells with sound to find the right patterns. Um, and so there is actually a growing number of biomedical researchers tapping into aesthetics like sound waves to design cellular structures because you know you change the frequency and the amplitude and the cells move into a new spot right in front of your eyes suggesting different uh, structural patterns. And as Susan, and I like to say this begs the question, you know, is life becoming art? Mm. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, we love this quote, and I think the ancients knew what Julie Bolte Taylor, who's a neuroanatomist, is telling us here, that most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel, but we're actually feeling creatures that think. Mm -hmm. And we now know we experience over 34,000 different feelings. But a little bit to what Jeff was saying, we, I do think we walk around thinking that we are thinking beings first that maybe feel once in a while or taught how to feel, but our physiology, as you'll hear more from Susan, we are designed to be feeling creatures that think. And once you start thinking about that, you see it from an entirely different lens. And so um, actually in 2019, the two of us had an opportunity to put the science of neuroaesthetics into action in real time to illustrate the effects of sensory perceptions on our bodies 
In this exhibit um, we did at the Milan Salone that 400,000 people attend called A Space for Being. Um, it was an exhibit, an example of enriched environments, default no mode network and the aesthetic triad, which we'll talk about. Um, and it was a collaboration between my team at Google, my design team, Susan's lab at Hopkins and an architect, Susan, uh, Suchi Reddy. So the way this worked is participants walked into the space, they were fitted with a custom band containing sensors that were continually taking in their biological information. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, the architect and we created three distinct living rooms um, that in each room, there was different music, um, different smells, different textures, different colors, all the elements of neuroaesthetics, which are the things that we take in through our senses. And they were invited to touch, smell, listen, and explore for five minutes in each of the three different rooms with no talking, no photos, no devices, just to be, i.e. a space for being. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as I said, each of the three rooms were designed with even different lighting. Um, we had had a grid of all the neuroaesthetic aspects and made sure that each room was differentiated by colors, textures, materials, shapes, music, and scent and lighting. And then at the end of the experience, the guests had their bands removed by a band tender mm -hmm. and their data was downloaded for them only. And of course then deleted. Um, and what we did is we asked people in which room, oh, by the way, the algorithm, um, was designed to see in which room was the body, the physiology least stressed or most relaxed. I mean, that was what we were trying to get to with the band is, um, and so we would ask people first, which room did you like best? And some people would say, you know, room number two, because I love the color of the couch or something. And then we would look at the data and show, um, and I think it's the next slide. Correlation to yeah, the fact that um, their body actually preferred room number three. And we were able to show, of course, we had to walk our talk and make the data as beautiful as the experience. And so we were able, the algorithm would analyze in which room did their body feel most at ease or least stress. And in about 58%, which is what we had hoped for, because it would have been a failure if it was a match. Like if everyone could say, oh, room number one and their body felt the same way, people mm -hmm. were shocked that in over half the cases, what they mentally liked was not what the physiology liked. And you know, they'd be, how could that happen? And then we were able to explain that we are feeling all the time and we are sensing all the time but our cognitive mind is not necessarily connected to our body. And, you know, all the press was saying to me, are, we, are you gonna do a, a band that um, tell, you know, tells us how, how you feel? And I'm, I don't wanna live in a world where a band has to tell me how I feel. I wanna be able to be connected. <laughs> We're designed uh, to know how we feel. If we yeah, it's my feeling. So it was really um, a great experiment where the public got to understand the concept um, basically of what Julie Bolte Taylor was saying that we're feeling beings first um, versus thinking beings first. And I think we walk around thinking we're thinking beings first. It, it's also really interesting too, if you think about it, our hypothesis, it's kind of sadly was people were not gonna connect to their feelings that we, that's, and so, and that's what happened. And I think, you know, it would have been a sort of extraordinary if if everyone would have sort of been in touch. And I think it just shows us how much work there is to do to help people really remember how they feel. And once they did, they knew that they would then make different decisions about how they lived their life and how they created spaces. And so that was also really profound. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and tell you a little bit about this whole field of neuro arts or neuro aesthetics. Um, the science of this area is called neuro aesthetics. The field is called neuro arts. And the exhibit that Ivy um, just shared was the first time that the public had really had an experience with neuro aesthetics. And this field has only really been around for around 20 to 25 years because technology is only now allowing us to non-invasively get inside our bodies and, and, our, and our brains to really understand what's happening with arts 
and aesthetic experiences. And so, um, you know, we now know that these experiences change um, a very broad physiological and neurobiological systems within us simultaneously. And that's pretty extraordinary. So your respiratory system, your cardio, cardio, cardi, cardio systems, your muscular systems, your neural systems are all in play at the same time, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, so let's see if this, this will, there we go. Um, so these systems connect through a process called neuroplasticity. And just from a sort of physiological point of view, we're all born with about a hundred billion neurons that connect at a synaptic level. So when these synapses, synapses connect, we're actually creating quadrillions of neural pathways in our brains. And these also create all kinds of connections to different parts of the, the body. So, you know, it's how we create memory, it's how we move, it's how we think. And what we know is that this physiological process of neuroplasticity is really underlies everything that we do. And to sort of bring that home, um, in the 60s, Marion Diamond, who was a neuroscientist, um, did an experiment um, where she created three different environments. One was an enriched environment, one was a kind of status quo environment, and then the third was an impoverished environment. And she did this with rats. And um, when in just two weeks after the rats had been in these different environments, she sacrificed them. And what she found was that in the rats that were in an enriched environment, their brain mass, the structure of their brains changed by 6%, which is sort of extraordinary. Their cerebral cortex has literally got bigger. The status quo, nothing really changed. But in the impoverished environments, she found that the brain mass actually got smaller. And so these things have been duplicated now. These kinds of experiments non-invasively have been duplicated in with people. And we know that enriched environments, sensory experiences really matter for how our brains and bodies grow and change and how they become healthy. Um, oops, sorry, let me move to the next slide here. Okay, so this is a, an image that's in our book and um, it's in the middle of the book and we included it because we really wanted to um, sort of share some of the sort of structure and geo geometry and geography of the brain. And so um, what I wanted to talk about here briefly is this idea around the, the sensory systems and the, the way that we bring the world in, but also introduce this idea around saliency. And so, you know, our brains bring have millions and trillions of sensory inputs are available to us at any time, but we could never bring all of that information into our, into our systems. And so the brain has this amazing ability to filter out what is either not important to us, is irrelevant, but importantly, what is really important to us from an emotional level or a practical level. And we're now starting to understand more and more about this idea around the saliency network and how we're able to discriminate and think about what we actually let in. And just a, as an interesting point, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you know, we only can process consciously about 5% of what information comes into our systems. So 95% of what's coming into our systems that's already edited is really below the level of consciousness. So it's really operating at an unconscious level. And so, you know, we're bringing all this information in and that's coming through the central network that helps to regulate bringing that information in, but it's the default mode network that really is that place in our brains where um, it's often called the sort of center of self. It's where we daydream, mind wander, decide what we like and what we don't like. It's really around this idea of the, the, the saliency network, but it doesn't go to work until we come offline, until we hit that pause button. So the default mode network is that space in between the notes. It's place where we're really able to hear our own voices. And I think it's a real shout out to why it's so important not to be overprogrammed. And early on, I think when we were talking about we're exposed to color, light, sound in every place and every moment, the ability to stop is so important. And just to kind of one other level here, um, this is a, a, a model that was created. It's an empirical model created by um, Anjan Chatterjee. And it's looking at, it's, what called, it's called the aesthetic triad. And it just kind of brings home the fact that it's our knowledge and meaning. So it's where we come from, what we know, 
um, that's so important in how we create aesthetic experiences. And then our individual sensory perceptions and motor systems, which are all unique to us individually, come into play. And then how do we value that? What are the rewards associated? What do we like and what we don't like because our default mode network has come online? It's at the center of those three circles where our unique aesthetic experiences are formed. So what I think is beautiful might be what you think is beautiful, but why we think it's beautiful is gonna be really different and how it moves us is gonna be really different. And while there's certainly universal things, um, we all have our own sort of unique aesthetic um, mindsets. And it's really sort of, I think important to really honor that and to know that and to, and to help to create those inputs for yourself that help you build and amplify your own potential. Be your own curator. Yeah, be your own curator. So um, just a couple uh, uh, thoughts and takeaways. Um, I mean, I talk a bit about sort of five takeaways in the work that we're doing. And I think the first one that's super important is that we have the proof. You know, we're beginning to build a body of science um, from a neurobiological perspective, but also from other disciplines that are really starting to show us that we are literally wired for art. And that, as I said earlier, it incorporates all of the different um, systems, brain, body, spirit. And it's really important that we begin to start to bring those forward in the ways that we solve for problems. And this idea, this field of neuroaesthetics is certainly around understanding the research. So understanding how our brains, bodies, and behavior change on these aesthetic and arts experiences. But the second part of the, the definition of this field is a translational one. So we're interested in knowing this so we can translate this knowledge into health, well-being, learning, community growth and flourishing. And, and so it's really important that we, now that we have the proof that we begin to look at how do you translate it? How do you use it? How do you really optimize for this, for this work? The second takeaway is really that there's an art for that. I mean, there are so many, no matter what the ailment, no matter what the problem is, there is a different art for that and you don't have to be good at it. And art and aesthetics are not a nice to have. They're essential to our very survival. And the evolutionary underpinning of the arts as prerequisites, as Susan mentioned, for human growth and development um, has continued to expand through the millennia. I mean, the bottom line is that the arts positively impact every area of your life, including your physical and mental health, learning, flourishing, and community building. And some of the incredible facts that science has now shown is that 20 minutes of art a day is as beneficial as getting enough exercise and sleep. Wow. So, you know, Susan and I remember, we remember when it took years for people to believe that they should exercise 20 minutes a day, even if it's just walking. And now science is showing that 20 minutes a day of art is, is as beneficial. So mm -hmm. one of our dreams is to have everyone doing 20 minutes of some art practice um, and 45 minutes of practicing art reduces the stress hormone cortisol, which I think was mentioned in the beginning. Um, these are just some facts. Playing music increases synapses and gray matter, which support cognitive skills. Um, by the way, I don't think we mentioned that actually doodling yeah. allows you to remember better. So you remember in school when our hands were slapped for doodling while the teacher was talking? Yeah. Little did she or he know, but we're actually by doodling and listening, we're going to remember what the teacher says better. You know, um, I took notes whenever a professor or teacher was talking, I would just take notes and I taught myself to, to write as fast as they talked. That really helped me imbibe the knowledge. That really cool. helped me grok For sure. It. Well, you know, you'll find this in, today at Google, this, my, my boss's staffing, everyone comes with their computer to take notes about what he's saying and I'm there writing every word. And sometimes I would get these looks like we're at Google, we're, you know, you're writing. And then I'm able to <laughs> say, yes, because, <laughs> yes, because I'm actually, that will help me remember what you're saying, boss, a lot better than if I was typing right now. Yeah. Um, and then this idea that, you know, writing down a secret, I find this fascinating. Even if you don't share it with anyone else, mm -hmm. says researcher James Pennebaker, uh, is shown to relieve stress and release cognitive load lower cognitive load. So just writing it down, Damn. getting it out of your, your inner self and on yeah. a piece of paper, and then even if you burn it or rip it up um, is so important. And also working with your hands. I mean, I really, um, 
worry, you know, at Google, my designers design a lot on computer, but I, I will bring in a, a sculpturist and, and have them work with clay because there's something about that hand mind connection yes. and working with um, clay, yarn, or even soil, because they, we say gardening is the slowest art form. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it turns out that your hands uh, stimulate skin and nerve endings and ignite the body's internal sensory receptors, mm -hmm. making you instantly uh, attentive and focused. And also things like working with both hands, you know, clay and knitting, for example, things that you have to work with both hands at the same time yep. are particularly as good, good for you because you're using your uh, con conscious and subconscious mind at the same time. Um, things like singing and humming activate the vagus nerve, engaging the parasympathetic systems to make you feel good. Um, light, uh, reading poetry lights up some of the same parts of the brain as listening to music stimulating the brain's primary reward um, circuitry. And um, yeah, so the invitation here is any of these arts, anytime and even 15 minutes a day um, will really have uh, profound effects. And pay attention to your inner process, not so much what you produce. Enjoy yeah. it. For absolutely. The doing. It's right. absolutely the process and not the end result. You know, we're so results orientated mm -hmm. um, because of efficiency and productivity. And a little aside here, but you know, the definition of play is doing something different yeah. than you do every day without a preconceived outcome. And because we're so outcome driven, it's actually the play, the ability to play, which makes us more creative and imaginative. And it really is key though, that you dive into it without judgment and without an outcome of, oh, I'm going to make this beautiful painting. I think that's what Mihai Shikmet Mihai was saying about flow state. You, a uh, hallmark hour goes by, feels like five minutes, but you're engaged, but you're creative. Mm -hmm. There's focus, well, but you're still creative and relaxed. It's an interesting absolutely. hybrid state. The time you know? Is, you know. Yeah. Well, and that's, as Ivy said, there's an art for that. And, and I think that, you know, depending upon what you're needing the art for um, can be a different art form and can be a different a different um, uh, a different approach. So the third takeaway is anytime, anywhere, any art form. And just to bring that home, um, you know, we do a lot of work when we're thinking about, um, you know, level setting. There's so much mythology around. You have to be good at it. You know, if you're not good at it, you can't do it. All of those things. And I think breaking some of those are, are really super important. But any age any ability um, anywhere is really um, holds true. And so these are just a couple of examples, some we've talked about, but you know, we know that the arts have been used for serious mental illness. Um, we also know it's used for stress and um, effectively um, a great go-to for anxiety. And in the book, we, we share some stories around first responders that are using art to really process trauma that's happening, not that happened a year ago, or six months ago, but it's happening every day for them. So they're not post-traumatic stress, they are constantly in current stress. And that's true for many communities who are living in constant um, uh, 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 trauma, that it's really important to be able to be able to release that on an ongoing process. We also know that in learning, arts transfers, and, and that's a transfer in any learning environment is the holy grail. There are certain skills that we learn that we only keep in one space, but these art experiences transfer. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier in enriched environments, we know that there's increased brain mass, um, but there's also increased myelination so there's a coating around the nerve fibers that is sort of a fatty fiber and it keeps all the knowledge, all the energy moving really rapidly. Arts help to increase myelination as well. And that's a really you know, major thing as we, as we age as well to be able to have this healthy brain function and structure um, and connect and that connectivity. You know, Susan, I think that might be because, you know, when we use our muscles, the body will build muscle because, hey, you're using it, you need it in life. And so the same thing would be true of art. The body's going to create the brain structure to help you do art because you're using it, because you need it to do art. So isn't it kind of self-fulfilling? The activity helps you build the very pathways, mechanisms, strength, um, juice to do it, to do the activity. I agree with that completely. And, yeah. you know, it's not 
unlike exercise or good nutrition or great sleep habits, right? But what the outcome of arts do or meditation, what the, I think the outcome of the arts have to do with this idea of, of all of the, the physical health, the mental health, flourishing, learning, you know, it's kind of a trifecta or a, you know, more than a trifecta, whatever that is, because it brings all of that together because we're wired for it. And so I think when you come back to that knowledge, it's just to have put it on the side is so it's like tying our hands behind our back, blindfolding us. Lose it and use us. it. Use it. Exactly. As a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> You know, one of the, in fact, one of the other facts before we talk about this, but it's related, is they're finding out that, um, and it's in the book, an MIT professor, a certain series of color, uh, sorry, lights and sound will activate removing the plaque from the brain um, in Alzheimer's patients. So there is this whole new category of immersive art Mm. art that you actually step into yes. um and so we think the future is immersive and sustainable and you know the technology arts health and science are coming together to offer new forms of innovation and solutions and this immersive and interactive exhibitions and kind of art is dissolving the boundaries between the art and the viewers and engaging our senses and creating strong emotional um reactions we're actually seeing expansive growth of these immersive arts that are creating this new form of expression that we think will impact health, education, and other sectors. So what you see here is, this is one of example, but Susan and I, it's a, it's a, and there's a lot of collaborations between, in this case, architects, musicians, designers. This was in um, Venice, California. The architect design is almost this beautiful womb-like white form and about 10 people can step into it at once. You lay back, eyes open, and it's almost like you're experiencing synesthesia, but you can see sound and hear color. And mm -hmm. so for, for 20 minutes, yeah, I think it's 20 minutes, you're in this immersed environment where your mind is twisted because it's not what you're used to. And therefore it empties the mind and when you come out of it, you are fully present. It's as if, you know, it literally has emptied your mind because, and it's a, because you, you've gotten you into this your mind. Yeah. Incredible sensorial space. And people are saying that uh, people are coming back to this experience in Venice. It's this art, artist group that um, it's in a shipping container, this experience. Huh. And people are lining up and coming back week after week instead of seeing their shrink. So instead of doing talking therapy or for anxiety, just coming and having this experience. And I really think it, we are going to be seeing more of these uh, popping up because, you know, on the trajectory of, I think psychedelics will be there on one end and it's you know great for certain cases. It's great for trauma, mm -hmm. but then these art experiences at the very opposite end, which are more lightweight, um, will will is really enabling some of the same things you know psychedelics will jump start your mind to multiple a new... mini sessions as opposed to one huge session yeah so yeah and so i think it's interesting yeah. yeah that we're all starving for this to get out of our minds mm -hmm. in some way and there'll be what i love about it is there will be these different ways to do this in fact the group of artists that are, are created this experience are now wanting to have one in every city, you know, even take over abandoned malls so that people who need to, you oh, know, yeah. de-stress or, you know, I love this idea that instead of going to the mall and going shopping, you'll come in and get out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Which you are cheaper. anyway when you walk into a mall. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, wait, I, I, Ivy, I, I, Ivy, I wanted to bring up the point that Colors in Motion would integrate into an atmosphere like this tremendously. What this would do is it would set the zone of which color and sound frequencies would serve the desired outcome, in this case, relaxation. But you'd be doing the same thing, only you'd be designing into the mix recognizable images that come and go. So they create that bit of miasma that you're working through, where you're there and then you're not there anymore. And then mm. the environment 
is distinguishable and then it's not. And you can oh. modulate the color base to make those transitions particular to the outcome that you're shooting for and then use the art that then enhances that experience. We'll be yeah, talking that, to your colors. The in artistic the ambiguity yeah. Yeah. of just not, not being able to name it and stop <laughs> it and mentalize it. Yeah. Okay, I got to tell you this. Here's the chamber right here in our minds. Mm -hmm. And there's many avenues, Jeff, to do what you're doing. And our work is one of them where you're just inputting some visionary experience that's very meaningful, often with color, emotion, energy, synesthesia happens, the whole thing. So yeah, we're wired to this and we can use our own endogenous chemicals to create it or some outer triggers to create it. But I think that these are healing experiences that, yeah, I agree, we hunger for. Oh, for sure. And there's and various delivery systems and it goes way back into human history. Right. Oh or, yeah, no, I, yeah. I think the future is we have to have these different delivery systems at all different yes. access points. And I experienced colors in motion and it's fantastic. I sent it to you, Susan, it's these beautiful watercolor landscapes that dissolve with music. I mean, it was so yeah. powerful and so, I mean, that in hospitals or even at home. I mean, I think yeah. I think we are, um, and, and that group that I just showed, Chromasonic, they're working with um, Adam Gonzali at UCSF to try and get some neuroscience measurements. But you bring up an interesting point, Jeff, that we could talk about in terms of the abstract color versus sure. recognizable. And landscapes is one of the only things that we universally recognize as beautiful. Um, so nature. it's very back to nature. And nature. Well, nature, you know, because nature yeah. is the most neuroesthetic place. Yeah. Where neuroesthetics, because it's the only place and it's where we come from, right? It is our nature <laughs> to be in nature. And as um, we were. Uh, it's home. It's their right, e, right, Yeah. E.O. Wilson pointed out that to us that 99.9% .9 of the time humans have been on the planet. We've lived in nature. It's only 0.2% that right. we've lived in the built environment as an experiment. And one could say it failed. Um, so, you know, going back in nature, because nature has all of the neuroesthetic elements, sound, texture, temperature, light, color, shape. I mean, it's the one place you can walk well, into. All of our receptor sites are designed to imbibe that, right? So Exactly, because we were, we were designed exactly. for that, by that. And so the fact that we've kind of ignored that um, <laughs> it's crazy. It. Well, yeah. and whether it's internally delivered or externally triggered, I mean, we need that, right? Yeah. Multiple and there is a difference though. Achieve. There is a big difference between drugging someone. And I say that as a child of the sixties and seventies, um, you know, you are imposing a chemical reaction into your nervous system, as opposed to something that is evoking a response from your nervous system. As a we don't use activating drugs. The sensory okay. currents. Yeah. Yep. You create the yep. sensory currents, and then you have the experience. Not you modulate them forcefully by drugging us. See, that's another mechanistic perspective. And Thank I'm not you. saying that's, never. That's why we do don't it. use drugs, and Jeff, and that's why in our work we believe that we have the neural pathways. They exist. And and well, you don't have to have, believe it. Therefore, the them. biochemicals <laughs> that can be internally generated. And ritual and art is such a powerful mechanism to generate those. And then it's just an inbuilt system, right? Mm, right. So That's, I think we're saying the same thing. You just said the same things yeah. in different ways. Just saying yeah. the same thing, yeah. 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 Well, so the nervous... just... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so we're, we're coming home. We have two more slides and then we okay. can... <laughs> So, and I think this is, you know, this is such a rich conversation and, and, I, and that's what I think this is, is we're really kind of going deeper and deeper. Um, but for this sort of our fifth takeaway is is really I think this idea of when you change your lens and you start to look at this work in different ways it is like changing the aperture of a kaleidoscope it's a very subtle shift that really changes the entire landscape and you know we've talked a lot about this area of mindset and I mean I've sort of have four principles around an aesthetic mindset and the first is curiosity it's how do you really have this beginner's mind in this space where you know, we don't allow for a lot of ambiguity in our worlds or the, being in these liminal spaces. The second is playful exploration and really being able to do things without an outcome. 
enlivening our senses, opening ourselves up to these sensory stim stimulations and feeling them as opposed to thinking that we're mind creatures and thinking creatures as opposed to feeling creatures. And then the third is actively being a maker and a beholder and, and sort of beginning to bring those four elements together as we sort of live our lives. And just to sort of kind of end our conversation as a, as a um, presentation, this is a kind of a, a, I think a mantra for us, which is art is our one true global language that speaks to our need to reveal, heal and transform. It transcends our ordinary lives, our ordinary lives, and lets us imagine what is possible. And I think we're in a moment in the flux, Jeff, that you mentioned where we need to be thinking and feel future, feeling our way into the future and what is possible. And that requires this kind of alchemy and imagination that um, we haven't been using. And so it's a very exciting time to bring ourselves forward, as Ivy was saying, in the, in, in the space of technology and humanity. So let us stop there and, and kind of continue the conversation. Well, first of all, fantastic, yeah. wonderful. Thank and you, yeah. that part of the presentation was so really significant to be able to lay the groundwork. And we started out today with just this uh, just, just vibing of conversation that was bringing out all this detail. And yeah, I, I mean, obviously we all just immediately resonate that, th yes, this is something, I, I know this, I feel this, I experience this, I wanna be a part of this. And somehow, like you said, there's been the suppression of it, and now we're just breaking away from understanding that this language is as critical as anything else. Yeah, maker do. as well as beholder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Give ourselves permission, isn't it, to play mm -hmm. in all these various arenas and to really activate the physiology, the inner technology that we have. We've been blessed with this. Mm -hmm. Let's use it. Let's live an optimal life, which is really, hello, let me honor the body, right? Let me, let me honor what I've got here. Let me actually put myself through the paces of doing. I, don't, I remember watching our dog. We have this beautiful wolf dog. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dogs living an artificial life being our, our companions. They're not out in the wild making their living. We're taking care of them. But mm -hmm. I'm walking out with him and he sensed a deer in a thicket of woods. And to watch, and I, I knew because I could hear the rustle of a deer. I, could, I knew what it was. But to see his eyes light up, his ears light up, the fur stand up, he was on alert, you know, he was so excited. And I thought, because you're designed to do that, because mm -hmm. nature gave you that capacity to do that. All of the biochemicals, the adrenaline, you know, to watch him come alive, to be as he was meant to be and not in our little artificial space, mm -hmm. like sitting back and slacking, you know, oh, right. you'll feed me. Oh, you'll take care of me. Oh, let's go for a walk. But like, I'm on high alert. There's the deer. Um, and it was just joyous to behold. And mm. I thought, why can't we get back to what we were designed to do? And art mm -hmm. is one of them mm. to be, to make beauty, to celebrate this universe to reflect back to this universe. You're magnificent. You're intelligently designed. You, you come in a live universe and I'm witness, I'm a participant. The energy's flowing through me and coming right back at you. I am in relationship yeah. to our designer, to evolution, to nature, to the whole cosmos. Ivy and, yes, oh, Ivy and that's Susan. Ecstatic. That's ecstatic. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Ivy and Susan, this has been so brilliant and so valuable and so uh, cerebrally exciting. And I wanted to ask if the two of you or either one of you, especially you, Susan, because of your role, if you would be willing to talk a, a little bit about a time when you felt this, not when you were studying this, not what the studies say, and not, but when you yourself really felt this experientially and from your heart. Oh, well, yeah. Um, well, good question. I can tell you the moment I knew this was real, um, and it's been a kind of lifelong um, deepening since that moment. Um, as Ivy said, I'm a twin, and my sister had a, a really serious accident when we were 12, and she almost lost her leg. And I had that experience where I lifted a piece of farm equipment off of her, like, you know, that adrenaline thing where you just do it. Um, but my sister was so hurt that um, she couldn't um, talk about it. She was tr traumatized. She was trapped. And um, my mom suggested, we're, we, I come from a family of makers. So I've been, um, you know, a doer, a maker 
cooking, handwork, poetry, you know, all of that my whole life. I mean, I, I was really born into it. So I didn't, you know, it's sort of like, you know, the David Wall Wallace Foster, Foster Wallace, where he talks about being the fish in the water and, you know, the old, the old fish comes up to the new, two young fish and he says, Hey guys, how's the water? And they go, what's water. That was my, that has always been my life because I've been in the water forever. I didn't know that everybody wasn't in the water, but my sister couldn't, share how she felt. And if you're, you know, anything about twins or you are a twin, or you have this experience where my sister and I, if I have a stomach ache, she's getting her appendix out. Um, like right now I'm having my sister broke her collarbone this week. And, um, I'm like, I'm walking like this because I'm feeling her pain. Um, she has a she has surgery tomorrow. And so, um, I couldn't feel her, couldn't feel her at all. And for me, that was like severing the spirit and so my mother suggested she started to draw and um, I was able to see through my sister's drawings, how she felt and because she couldn't find the words, but she could draw it. And then we were able to then have more get back to each other. And she was able to get back to herself more importantly. And so um, I think I've always felt it. Um, and studying it for me is curiosity. You know, I mean, I, I don't think of it being empirical and external. It's, it's all felt. I'm fascinated by the research and the researchers and the translation and the lived experience. And so, I mean, I, I, I just am in the water. That's, I guess it's the best way to describe it. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't know if you want me, for me, having been started as an artist and a metalsmith, I mean, that flow state, I'd wake up in the morning and couldn't wait to get into my studio and disappear, essentially, where time time went away. I mean, I wasn't cognizant of um, even thinking about what time it was. I was just kept... Um, creating, asking myself the next question, trying the next thing. And it was a, the way, the only way I knew to be. Um, and, you know, you think everyone is like that <laughs> till you get older and you realize, oh, not everyone does that. Um, and that's when I realized, wow, everyone does need to do this because it's so good. It feels so good. And it gives your, it, it, it was clear to me, it was a way to nourish ourselves and that um, our cognitive mind is one thing. We need all our tools in the toolbox. But um, so that's when Susan reached out and I heard about that. I'm like, oh my God, people need to understand. Those who don't have never had the joy of experiencing it um, need to understand it and be given permission to do it again. And the world needs to know that this is, you know, art is medicine. And, you know, there's so much shame too. There's so much shame, you know, people are embarrassed, you know, to say, oh, I, you know, I doodle with them and they're so shut down. And I think that has been maybe the most egregious thing that's happened. And especially in the Western culture is that we, we make fun, you know, we, we minimize people doing things. We, we, we don't pay artists, you know, to do their work. You know, it, I feel like, Art has not been valued. It's not the commerce that gets valued and we pay for what we value. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's a real moment to really think about what we've, what we've done to ourselves in, in cutting this off and minimizing it. Beautiful. I want to say that the built environment is something that big companies like Google and Apple and all the rest of them are looking at, hey, we can make our employees happier, more productive, interactive, design a building to support that. That's a big thing. But we can also design our own homes to support our own creative aspects. Mm -hmm. And I remember Paul putting his guitar and you play piano really at fingers, you know, like right there, because you read an article that said, if it's not grabbable in three seconds you're gonna yeah. go oh well it's too much trouble to go out and get it out of the closet well, if you put your guitar but in a case and put it in the, in the closet it's going to stay in the closet but if you put it on a on a stand yeah. where you have to walk by it constantly you'll play guitar a lot you have or oh, yeah. five minutes let me that that down. And then yeah. it'll turn into an hour exactly. right you give yourself more more yeah. permission and i think it's it's you know i see like my mom got hilarious when a friend of hers handed her an adult coloring book she just thought how bizarre but then I kind of slightly put it, but mom, that's a lovely gift. Come on, put it in front of her, gave her some, she was 
just engaged. Mm -hmm. So I think, wow. Or um, mom, please don't hire a designer to do your home. Like do it yourself. Like you know what you like. You don't need anybody else telling you. It doesn't have to be for anybody else. Come on, mm -hmm. just do it. And you know, that sure. kind of thing. I mean, we can create our environments to like, I tell my friends, I put my own art on the wall, paint your own painting, change yep. it out. My sister did something clever. She got in her kitchen where she spends a lot of her time. She's a good cook. She got this big magnetic board. She had it put up and painted the same color as her wall. And then she puts her own art notes, images she likes, stuff on there. She got these really cool Collage. magnets that look like rocks. And so it's her changeable window to her soul, she calls it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, can we put us, can we make our built environment, our own environment, reflect ourselves, mm -hmm. put things in front of our own eyes? It, own it, own it. We have people doing art in our, in our work and they're going, oh, I got to put this on the wall to remind me because every time I pass it, it will be like a talisman. It will be a reminder mm -hmm. of that beautiful moment sure. of flourishing and it will just help me. And I think there's something about you said creator and maker. Yes, it's beautiful to create our art, but also to imbibe art to, mm -hmm. we love to imbibe, in, imbibe the art of the ancients. There's so much power and message Significant. in that it's reaching down into our core. It means something. And in toptic phenomenon as well, we see a lot in our visions. We see it on cave art. It's built in the architecture of our brains. There's something about that signaling. I'm bemused by the fact that the hashtag is now such a ubiquitous symbol, but we find it, what, 50,000 years ago in cave art. Mm -hmm. It's an architecture of our brain. So Earth's glyphs are all around us. Nature's glyphs are all around us. How can we use those, incorporate them? Mm -hmm. How can we bring more nature into our lives? Um, how well, can you, we do that? We can curate ourselves. For this. Yeah, no, you bring up something really important is that we have agency over what we surround ourselves with. And yeah. it's not about money, right? It's about paying attention to what's salient for you, what, which may be different than what's salient for someone else. Um, and, you know, I know the art that I put on my walls. It's not about collecting it because I think it will be valuable. There's a piece, there's something of me I see in it. And that every time I walk by, I want that reflection. It's a very personal thing. Um, Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the built environment Set up is- our tuning forks. Um, yeah, yeah. No, and have access to them, as you say, immediately. That's why I loved what you said about the art barn that someone, you know, you can walk in there and immediately pick up a tool. I mean, I know it got me crazy when I was a kid, I'd make collages and I'd go out, I'd leave my room a mess because I was in that creative zone and I needed a break. Yeah. I'd go outside and play. I'd come back. My mother had put everything back in the cabinet. And I'm like, what did you do? Because I was in that creative mode. So having access to that where you can spontaneously start to express um, is super important. But, you know, space changes the way you think. And so that's why architecture is an art. And we've really screwed that up uh, in terms of, you know, we, we are building our schools with no windows. I mean, all the things that we know we need because we came from nature, which is light, space, air. I mean, we are doing for efficiency sake, in a lot of cases, the absolute opposite. And so that's what we have to revisit. I mean, I love where you guys live. At least the form is this, you know, circular form that goes against the angles of a true building. But that's more natural. You know, you're living in a stone. I mean, it's like, it's, that changes. Well, but the our way. first housing was a little egg, you know, like a little dome, right? Yeah. So, oh, I love, yeah. I, I have to bring up my favorite quote from Winston Churchill. My dad was a big fan of Churchill. We shape our buildings and they in turn shape us. Yeah. It, it, yeah. The built environment is like a living architecture. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go way back, Ivy, in the very beginning, you said something very profound that really clicked for me, and that you were describing the impact of AI, and how it can take care of some of that, those tasks so that we can free ourselves up. It's such a positive spin, because you hear a lot of concern, a lot of fear and anxiety over what's happening with the world of AI. You're, you're definitely uh, engaged in the world of AI, being, an, being a, 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 an executive with Google and all that you're going through, but you're also holding another space of art. It's fun. 
Google needs to have you lead a full team just on art because Google needs to maintain that. All these come, come to meetings, no, no laptops, no smartphones, come to a meeting mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about, we're going to go ahead and have pencils and paper and some crayons or whatever. What and are the, the principles because, we're trying to incorporate into these and yeah, where so, we're going? Because it's something that, you know, yeah. where the work that we're doing, we're saying, you know, we got to make that balance between AI and just that natural intelligence from within ourselves. We're not trying to Our inner squash one or the other, but but we have to maintain that inner technology because the outer technology is growing at a pace so intensely that it's really easy to get lost in that. So how do you see all of that? Or for the tail to wag the dog here. Well, you went mute yeah. somehow, Ivy. Let me second. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, I think it's a bit intentional. Um, so first of all, I think it's not either or, it's and both. Yes. And I think, you know, um, Technology, every, I know Kevin Kelly, I once read the definition of technology is anything man-made. So it's a car, it's a door, it's a window, you know, and technology only stays around if it's useful. If doors and windows weren't useful, we'd society wouldn't buy them and we'd get rid of it. Yeah. So um, every technology has a, a good and a bad side. And to me, it's just, it's, it's, that is just reality. I mean, but the, the important thing is whose hands it's in and then we have to amplify the good because there will always be the, the negative side. Um, I do think that, like I said, we have been operating almost like training our brains to be machines and mother nature has a sense of humor. It's like, okay, you, you're training yourself to be machines. Well, here come the machines that can do these things you know, faster or look up something quicker. So what are you gonna do humans? And I think it's intentional to, like you said, push us to our humanness to understand our humanness um which i think is to spend the time to go back inside and understand these true gifts and technologies that we have to be able to we desperately as a society need to imagine together a mm. world of possibilities and we need to be able to step into that but we need to be exercise the muscle called imagination and Thank then we need you. to be coherent about that image of the world we want to create. And then, and then we need to co-create back with the machines because I believe together we're going to bring society, we're going to go to a whole other place. And I do think we have to look back to move forward, but it's not taking literally, you know, redoing what the ancients did, but that too, there was technology there. Mm. Um, and so how do we understand that, look back to look forward and then, um, take this time and use the machines to do some more rational things, give ourselves the time to be more creative, be more imaginative, understand more about ourselves, and then work with the machines and together, you know, there's a reason the universe put us humans together right now. And I am so grateful to be here at this time, even though it's an incredibly challenging time, I think out of chaos comes creativity. And I think that's what's happening now. I mean, everything is both breaking down, there's challenges, but I think um, if we can stay the course, which is, you know, understanding our human humanness um, and not get too crazy uh, or, or deterred um, and understand how we've got to work together. But I think we've been ignoring our humanness because I think we have, you know, like I said, been optimizing for efficiency. And that really isn't what humans should be doing. And that that's started the with the, that started really with, you know, think about the industrial revolution and, you know, how we minimized all of these things that were so human. And it's been a progression and sort of naming it and stopping it is super you know, holding it, holding it in, as Ivy says, the yes. And the, the other thing that, you know, just a, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I think it's interesting outcomes of some things like right now um, we're seeing um, technology uh, actually help people who can't speak, speak with their, their own words. Now um, we're seeing technology be very effective in <clears throat> working with people with autism using the arts and technology through narrative and story or other models. And so, you know, if we understood our humanness, meaning what do we need? What do we need to feel most alive? There is There are these marriages that I think can be really effective. There's another thing I saw recently that I was blown away with those people with severe mental illness um, who couldn't explain 
how they felt to their loved ones. And they shared what they felt with AI. And they said, I want my image to look like Van Gogh. I want my, um, the, these are the feelings that I want to share. And then this artwork appeared. And, you know, that's a form of creative expression in partnership with a, with a, they were not gonna, they didn't feel that they were gonna be able to share what they needed to say at such a nuanced level. So it's not an either or, but it's a complicated conversation that we wanna have. Beautiful. And we need to not just be consumers, but creators more and more. I remember um, friends came over with their little kids and like, I keep paper and pens and crayons for kids to occupy them. And I handed them, oh, hey kids, what we're talking about. And the kids would have preferred their screens. And I'm like, well, I get it. But how about more games or more things to use technology to create with, as opposed mm -hmm. to just let something be bop, 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 consuming? And so I'm sh quite sure that that is going to also, I don't know kids' games. I don't have kids. But, um, you know, they're developing those as well, right? So kids can participate, be interactive, create, mm -hmm. draw. And, um, you know, we have things, you know, create with their little phones. Well, we have one, one, one of the people that's part of our leadership program, uh, uh, Sharon from Canada. And she says she, her family has what they call uh, technology free Thursdays where the, the oh, kids yeah. in the family just don't have to get, they can't use the, the technology all day. Lay long. it down for a while. Lay it down. And, and yeah. let's listen to the yeah. thing. So yeah. that's a clue. Cool yeah. yeah, no, this is within our control. We just have to have the control to do that. I know others that the discipline, like have, you said, exercise yeah. that muscle. Yeah, yeah, a technology Shabbat, and they don't touch their device. I mean, like I said, it's both and, and it's knowing what to use for what. Mm. Um, and I think that's within our control. Yeah. Like have a game plan for it. I know. Yeah. 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 And AI yeah. is going to do amazing things in education and health. I mean, every child, you know, will be able to have a tutor. Every child, I mean, it, it, there will be some amazing things. But I think, like I said, we have to exercise our imagination, be even more creative with what we can do with it. And I absolutely agree. We need to bring back, you know, the non-digital in terms of working with our hands, playing games, card games together with our families. But I mean, uh, very much both yeah. ends. Yeah. And I would say that those ancient cultures knew something about building community, about art as repository, about using art in beautiful ways, about the full spectrum of art, the social spectrum of how to yeah. use our brain, mm -hmm. that there's beyond the linear and rational thinking, there's a lot of spectrum here that we need to activate and enjoy and, and bless. And so I think it's about bringing that wisdom forward, articulated in the new way that the new tools, yeah. any good Aboriginal elder will use whatever tools are at hand and, but for the good, right? For a healthy, expressive um, use for yeah. community, yeah, we're running, for working running with nature, not against her. And I think those are some of the principles that's that we can learn from our, our ancestors. I'm looking at some of the, the, the chat yeah. and bird, I think brings up something that might we could talk about that this feels elite that uh, this conversation can become elite right like it's oh for, i see yeah, yeah people have to work right people need jobs is ai gonna take over jobs and i think that's you know the, the i think art has become elite you know you, you you know it's it's commercialized it's consumered and i think this conversation she's bringing up is a really important one like how does this work for you know, under-resourced communities for people who don't have access to um, technology in that way. And, you know, I think that's just, that's something that we should continue to talk through. And Mary, um, do you want to say, I know Mary Bird. Mary, do you want to, how do we do this? Part? Oh, yes, thank you. No, that's what I was getting at. How, how do we serve the under-served people? Of course, education and going into the schools and so on. But beyond that, uh, you know, it's, I think in the past, it's people that have had the resources come from, from uh, well-to-do families that were able to become artists and writers and so on because they didn't have to do the drudgery of, of everyday uh, service to others in order to, to do what they wanted. So yeah, I think it's a big question there. I, I, I just, uh, I too am concerned about AI in this regard. So that's why I brought it up in the chat room. I appreciate the democratization of everything. Now we have access to all the tools to be artists and creators and have our get our voice out there. 
um, the question is, what are we saying? And how can we amplify those messages together? And, you know, I, I just, um, well, we have to end on time, Ivy, to get you out the door and on your next flight. Mm -hmm. So I want to say, how about conclusion? What would you both like to say? And you go first, Ivy. What is your end note? Well, well, I'm thrilled. I, I, I'm thrilled for the conversation. And it seems like your audience is totally, you know, because of what attracts them to you um, and the work you're doing are so primed for this. So I think it's really, um, and certainly everyone, you know, through uh, Laura, you know, share things you want to get to us um, and we'll look at that. Sure. But anyway, I think, you know, we need to all uh, rise to the occasion now. And um, some of us are already artists, others encourage, we need to encourage each other to express ourselves. Right. Um, and as you see these things pop up in your schools or in your community is to just continue to support them because this is, you know, we've seen the different sectors that are responding to this, but it needs um, holding the space and propping it up and continuing to fuel the fire. So anything you could do to do that, if you believe this would be great. And we'll continue to share with the world what we learn and know that Susan and I are doing whatever we can to empower people and educate them as to how important this is. Right. Susan? And, you know, go to your community and take the empty buildings and get some funding to create these art chambers and sound baths and light. Or do a salon in your own living room. And yeah. you, right, you can start in your own living room sure. and just have Why great not? space to yeah. to in knowing knowing what how it's impacting your physiology yeah. Yeah. and your mental state. And yeah, Susan? We can do something. You, you know, I, I, this is such a great conversation, and I love the way you are hosting the community here because. It's really thoughtful and um, and I have so many more questions than I have answers. Um, but I think the thing that just rose up for me in this is that where does the power sit in the world? And, you know, art expressive, art sharing our voices has been the change agent throughout society, throughout the world, throughout millennia. And it's dangerous because it's so powerful. Like if you want to, you want to shut a community down, take away their art. You want people not to, um, you know, lift up, take away books. That's happening, right? You know, and so I feel like we are sitting on the answer to true humanity in terms of self-expression agency, what Ivy just said. And I think we need to really know how much power we have. And we've been, um, systematically uh, uh, devalued and moved into an infinite stage of we, there's nothing we can do, right? And I think this is that move, the movement of, of that that happens to also help us with physical and mental health and flourishing and all of those things. So I think there's a, this is also about power, um, real power, real energy, real movement, um, you know, and, and you know, we talk about it as a movement, but it is movement. And I just think <clears> we need to, embrace that and somebody put something in the thing around intention i love the word intention i think when we commit to an intention providence opens up and things happen and you know i think we have to remember that the universe conspires with our intention and um, <laughs> it builds what we're actually doing it gives us the wherewithal to do it just like those muscles just like those brain neurons and oh. I, um, I just want to invite you both back sure. to talk I further think we should about talk. more if you, on you ever have time. to scratch the surface. Yeah. And I agree, it's all of the above. It's all voices. It's all of us together. It's every drop in the ocean needs to be heard and celebrated. Um, all modalities, all voices, all forms of art, all mm -hmm. the notes in the symphony, right? Yep. And bless the technology like Zoom and the internet and everything else. Our devices that we can share and speak together across the world. And I wanted to yeah, come together in real time. And like Tanley said, also support it on the level of local public schools. Yeah. This doesn't have to be, you know, you, everybody has to go to a Waldorf school or something. Right, right. Yeah. So, so let's, right. let's get our yeah, back right. down well, the, the public, you know, like I said, in California, the public schools voted to put an art teacher in California in every school. And so we kind oh, of yeah. said, oh my God, California will now be a model. And if this goes well, 
you know, which it will, because we know that it helps learning and all these statistics by putting art back in the schools, then hopefully every state will put a teacher in every school. So that's, you have to start somewhere. One small step for mankind. <laughs> <laughs> one small step. Right? One, one anyway, of thank, thank yeah. you so much. Thank I need you, to yeah. speak off. Okay. Before you Thank you both your, so your much. Art on and, brain, how yeah. art, your, your, your brain on brain art. On art. <laughs> oh, oh, both. Or your art, or your art, art transforms us. Art. Both works. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Wonderful discussion. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bless